is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to you, your conscience. For Christ's love completes us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We are <coughs> therefore Christ ambassadors, as through God we're making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We read... <coughs> um, hmm. Anyway, <laughs> through God, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So be it. Thank you. think the word's wrong, Kim, but yeah, but we do share his power when we share his love because we couldn't do it otherwise, but I saw you look and I looked, and you know, a lot of Christians do realize that they should die to sin, but they don't realize that they should live for Christ, unfortunately. They continue to live for themselves still, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today, that Jesus did die so that we wouldn't live a life of sin, but also so that we would be his ambassadors. Not just live a good life, but to literally go and tell others. So let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for the comfort of this building, the warmth. We thank you for the snow, the sunshine. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we do have in this country, and we pray, Lord, that we know that you are in control of all things and that you will work all things together for good to those that love you. We also just pray that, that we realize that you are in control. No matter what happens when we change government positions or anything else that happens in our lives, that you will work all things together for those who love you, that Jesus Christ will come again and that he will reign that not one hair on our head will be touched without you knowing it being in your will. And we, Lord, have called, been called by you to die to our sins, to live by the power of the Spirit. And as our Lord and Master suffered, Lord, help us not to complain about suffering, but to count it as a privilege, as Scripture says, that we may be a light to the world, that we may draw men to you, Father, that we can literally become fishers of men. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you're coming to Sunday school class, you might recognize the book cover looks a lot like that magnet down there. Okay? So, that's what the magnet was designed off the book cover. And I wish I were out of these so that I could call and try to get more of them. Okay? So, make sure you get yours. Because this is designed to put on your refrigerator so that you can make a uh, written uh, whatever you want to say, diagram, tic-tac-toe, we'll call it that, of who your neighbors are so that you take time, energy, effort, because you have to go out of your way to do these things, to be a neighbor to those that are around you. And Jesus said that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then into Judea, Samaria, and to the other, in, other ends of the earth. So you've got to start with your neighbors closest to you. Don't forget, there's sheets up here, and if you read your reading that I told you to last week, you can mark off five different chapters, six different chapters that you've read. And then the cards are Jesus' promises to you, and I'll go over that again in a minute. And the jars, if you don't take these jars and put your promises, thoughts back in them, I'm going to get some beans from Barb. Where's she at? I'm going to give them to you, and we'll get beans. But I'd much rather you put your promises in because of what Jesus gave you. I don't even need a sermon after the hymns that Debbie picked out. I mean, do you realize that God's one and only Son came and gave up His life so that you would be freed from the penalty and the power of sin, 
so that you would be his ambassadors, that you would follow in his footsteps, that you would fish for men, not fish for things, but fish for the kingdom of heaven by catching men. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we talked about the greatest commandment before. We talked about the great commission. And we talked about whether or not it applied to you or whether it just applied to those select few that God has called. He called all of us to be fishers of men. So we're going to apply that today. Am I on? Yes. Okay, I don't remember turning it on. I'm sorry. We're going to apply this great command, this great commission, so that we can learn a new fishing philosophy. How's that? That our lives were created in the first place by God to worship Him. And that when He sent His Son to die and gave us new birth through the Spirit when we believe in Jesus Christ, that we have a new fishing philosophy like we've never had before. That God loves us so much that He would send His one and only Son to die for us. We have this message, this obligation, as though Christ were making this call and commission through us. That we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So I ask you again, are you a disciple of Jesus? Because if you're not a disciple of Jesus, I don't know if I can apply the word Christian to you or not. You can get mad at me for saying that all, you, all, all I want to, whatever. The word mathetes means pupil, student, or learner. You should be constantly eating and devouring the Word of God so that you can be an approved workman who rightly handles the Word of truth. So that on that day you're not ashamed, but instead you can stand confidently before your God and Maker and know that you use the power that He gave you to live the life that He renewed for you, gave you anew, because of how much He loves you. He does it all for you, but it has to be your choice to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow after Him. Because if you never deny yourself you're certainly not going to take up a cross. And if you don't do those things, you're not going to follow after Jesus. You're still going to be longing and following after the master of this world. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. Scripture's clear of that. You're either fishing for men or you're not. If you are with Him, then you should be fishing for men. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. So I told you to read 1 John chapters 1 through 5 and John 14. This week, if you read these uh, different chapters, you might get some more insight on probably what I'm going to go over next week. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, where Jesus writes His letters to the seven churches. These are further instructions. I don't know if you thought about it that way, but Jesus came, He started His ministry, and He taught His disciples. And then he left and gave them a great commission. He said, don't worry about whether the kingdom of God is going to happen at this point or not. It's not for you to worry about those things, but you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. So we have the church age. But then we get another little P.S. after this where Jesus writes a letter to seven actual churches and says, here's kind of a, a quality report on you, how you're doing. And those reports were not that great overall. I'll just say that. Up to you to read them. And then read John chapter 13. You read John chapter 14 this past week. And then read John chapters 15, 16, and 17. So you'll get Jesus' last discourse to His disciples as well as you'll get the letter that He wrote to the churches several, uh, several years after He ascended into heaven. So what did we read in 1 John? We read that there were false teachers. Oh, there still are, aren't there? That there are persecutions, that there are temptations. And there was a wondering if Jesus Christ would really return. Or if He had already returned and they had, they had missed His coming. We still have those same questions to answer today. But we know the truth if we study God's Word. John's response, this is, remember, from the son of thunder that wanted to rain down fire and brimstone from heaven on those that wouldn't accept Jesus' coming. His response is to love, love, love. 
not just love, but love like Jesus loves until the day when Jesus comes again and makes all things uh, new. Jesus is the reason and the power and the hope that we live the way we do or the way we don't. Is Jesus really the reason? Does your life show it? Is He really the power behind how you live? Because He loves using those success stories of these ain'ts that become saints. And He loves showing His mighty power when you know there's no way you can do this that He says, we don't need all these men. We can fight this battle because I'm going to fight it for you or whatever it is. Or there's a giant standing in front of me that's defying the armies of God, but all we need is one brave person to stand up because it's the power of God that will defeat the enemies, not you or I. Is Jesus the hope that you have, that you don't live for this world, but you live for eternity? Is He the power that you live a different life than what you lived before? Is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life for you? To be able to love, we must let the Spirit change the way we think to renew our minds so that we don't think about worldly desires, that we don't see things through a physical lens, but we see things through a spiritual, eternal lens, that we don't see things by our own power and our own might, but by God's power and His might, that we don't see things by our fleshly desires, but we see things by the Spirit's desires. The old man is gone away, and behold, the new man is here. And as a child grows, you will grow as you continue to nourish and feed on God's Word, to study and meditate, to get together with Christians and fellowship, and as you start practicing the great command and the great commission. As you step out, you learn that maybe, just maybe, you'll walk on water for a little bit. But you've got to realize that it is God's love that compels you. To be, as Jesus says to the churches in the letters in Revelations 2 and 3, an overcomer. In John 13, Jesus gave a new command to love, not to love because that was something that's all throughout the prophets in the Old Testament, but to love as He loved. Well, there's no way I can do that. You're right, there is no way I can love that way. But there is every way that God can love that way through me if I will just let him. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells us not to worry, not to worry about the things of this world, not to worry about the mission that lays in front of us, not to worry about what we eat or drink, the persecutions that we face, not to worry about any of those things because he is going to prepare an eternal home for us and he is going to return for us. Meanwhile, meantime, however you want to say it, we have an obligation and a duty to live as Christ lived in this world and to tell others about the peace, the joy, the hope that we have. And not just tell them, but to show them. Do you believe this? Are you a disciple that is living as Jesus lives, being trained up by Him to follow in His footsteps? Are you fishing for men? And if you're fishing, guess what? Every once in a while, even if you're using different bait than you thought you you could catch fish with before and everything else... Every once in a while, you might catch something, right? And when you do, then you train up, you put your effort, you put your time into that person so that you train them up in fear and admonition of the Lord. You spend your time discipling that person so that they will carry on and disciple others. Training them to live as Jesus lived. So the first commandment that Jesus really gave was to come and follow me. You'll find it in Matthew 4, 19. The words you've heard me say before in the Greek are dute o piso mu. It says, come and follow me and what? I will make you fishers of men. The power is not in you. The power is in Jesus and his finished work. You have to be willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him. And if you do, the command here is clear. You will be fishers of men. Now think about that. All of us here have family. Do you not want your family to be with you in heaven for all eternity? 
then what in the world can you compare this life to if you could do everything and gain the whole world but lose your own soul? But what about the souls of those coming after you if you don't take seriously this new fishing philosophy? Come and follow after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus' last command, I said it earlier, was you will receive power. You will be my witnesses. You'll find it in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and you'll find it in Acts 1.8. And the angels had to tell the disciples, why are you standing here? Go and do what Jesus said. And they had to go and wait. The biggest commission, the biggest thing they've ever, they've been trained for years for this, and Jesus says, go and wait. Go and pray, because you cannot do this on your own. It will be my power working through you. And when the Holy Spirit came, the church exploded, even in persecution. And then we get the PS in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 to stand firm. Don't let anything get you down. Continue to buy from Jesus what you need until He returns. No matter how bad this world gets, whether 2021 is worse than 2020, whether there's a new strand of coronavirus, or there's socialism in the United States, it doesn't matter. Jesus is in control, and you have a mission and an obligation to fish for men. And you know, sometimes those fishing waters, when they're rougher, catch more fish. Just saying. Stand firm. And you get to that last letter in Revelation where Jesus makes it clear, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'll leave that for you to read. So here's some of the things that you should have read from last week from 1 John. I'm going to read in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things so that you will not sin. That's the first thing. You are dead to sin. You are a new creation in Christ. Why would you continue to do the things that you should not do? Put them away. They have no power, no control over you. If you're still doing it, you're doing your will, not God's will in your life. Okay? So that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we can be sure that we have come to know Him. How? If we keep His commands. Verse 4. If anyone says, I know Him, but does not keep His commands, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone keeps His word, the love of God has been truly perfected in him. That's where we're growing to, is that being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Letting the Spirit transform us through and through. By this we know that we are in Him. Verse 6, whoever claims to abide in Him must walk as Jesus walked. So we need to study God's Word to see what Jesus did. You know, years ago, and it's still popular, was that what would Jesus do? You don't need to know what Jesus would do because you have what Jesus did. And He tells you exactly to do the same thing, to follow in His footsteps and to forsake all these other things for the kingdom for the love of those around you so that they may come to know Jesus Christ personally and be forgiven and pardoned for their sins because it's God's will that all men not die but come to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing you a new command but an old one which you have had from the beginning. This commandment is the message that you have heard. Then again, I am also writing to you a new commandment. Because now we can see God's love in the flesh, how Jesus Christ lived because He is the exact representation of God. And we have the Holy Spirit, God, living inside of us that will teach us how to live and empower us how to do it. So it is totally new, but it's the same old commandment where I couldn't be justified by the law, where I couldn't do it myself. Now it is possible as long as you'll let the power live through you. I am writing you a new commandment which is true in Him. Because it's true in Jesus, it is also in you. Verse 8. For the darkness is fading and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims to be in the light but hates his brother, he is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother remains in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now you're going to read what is the opposite of the great command. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Verse 15. 
if we're looking at black and whites, truth and a lie, heaven or hell, life or death, this is the exact opposite of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. To love the world instead, the things that it can offer, and the master of its world. Oh, it is great that we have sunshine today, but will you praise God? Let's, let's read Job maybe next week. <laughs> will you praise God when there's not sunshine and freedom? When your health is down? I mean, Every time that, Je that Satan did something to Job, he said when Job responded back positively, righteously, Satan said, well, wait a minute, if I do this, he won't. Will you praise, thank, and love God no matter what your circumstances are around you? You should, because your names are written in heaven, and no one can take that away from you. You should rejoice and be thankful without ceasing. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have competing love affairs in your life. Either you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, or you don't. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, eyes and the pride of this life, is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God remains forever. Now I'm going to move to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 16, by this we know what love is. Okay, let's find out. Jesus laid down His life for us. This is love. That God would send His Son and that Jesus would die for His brother, for His friend, for His enemy at that time because we were all enemies. He died to give you life, and not just to give you life, but that you would have life in abundance. I just said two of my little cards already, and I'll tell you that in a minute. You recognized it. He came to give us abundant, peaceful, joyful life where the things of this world that would never satisfy, and that's why this world is in such a hurting state that we'd find the peace and joy in just knowing Him, and then on top of that, know that our names are written in heaven. So how can we not rejoice? If anyone with earthly... Or let me, I didn't finish, excuse me. Verse 16, By this we know what love is. Jesus laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Now, how do we do this? Verse 17 tells us, If anyone with earthly possession sees his brother in needs but withholds his compassion from him, how can the love of God abide in him? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. Because I know I've done it plenty of times where I saw a need, and I want to justify many times, well, that's because they didn't work, or that's because of this or that, or, or someone else will help them. But Jesus laid down his life in verse 15 for all of us everyone, that they might be saved. And we ought to lay down our life for our brothers. Okay, well, we can put brothers means that's the church. Or we can just take brothers as mankind. If anyone with earthly possession sees a brother in need but withholds his compassion from him, how can the love of God abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and in truth. So I have to ask myself, am I doing this? And I have to go back, I study scripture, it pops all up, and I go back to that good Samaritan, who is a Samaritan, they're not good, who that did help his neighbor, who wasn't really his brother, because this is the story Jesus gave right after being asked that. So I'm going to get out of this that brother means mankind, not just you guys, that if I see anyone in need and I'm not willing to help them because I'm not willing to die and give up, but Jesus gave up everything to save his enemies, then am I really living like Jesus in this world? Hmm. Verse 23, I'm going to skip to it. And this is his command that we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and we should love one another just as He commanded us. Whoever keeps His commands remains in God, and God abides in Him. And by this, 
we know that He remains in us by the Spirit He has given us. So if I live by Jesus' commands, which the great command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is like this, to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that doesn't say, brother, that just says neighbor. And that who is my neighbor was somebody that was even an enemy when Jesus gave this. Then that gives me a call to love everyone as Christ loved. There's the new command that we have. To love them enough that I value their eternal security or not more than I value my own things of this world, even my own life. Because if I do dump time and effort and money and everything else into this individual that needs Jesus, chances are the more that I put into that, the more the chances are that there's going to be a catch, isn't there? And if I put it to prayer and put that effort out there and we pray together in the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much and where two or three are gathered in his name, then we might could just make a difference in spreading the gospel message as the church did in Acts. Even if there's persecution and suffering in the world. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. No condition on a neighbor or brother, just in general here. Verse 9, This is how God's love was revealed among us. This is how God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Not live for ourselves anymore, but to live as Christ lived in this world. This temporary world that doesn't even... I I can't go that small and let you see the space compared to eternity. And we're to live as Christ lived. Whoever does not love does does not know God because God is love. This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent His one and only Son in the world so that we might live through Him. Verse 10, and love consists in this. Not that we love, but that He loved us and sent His Son as atoning sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, let me say it again, John says, we ought to love one another. My verse is for my jar, and I'm going to explain this again so you understand. These are promises, they're words of Jesus for for everyday living. There are 50 things that Jesus said in here to inspire you, to uh, give you strength, whatever it might be. And the ones that Sherry and I have pulled out so far are John 10.10 and Luke 10.20, which say, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, and rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, I don't know what Sherry took from that, but I know I went back and studied those scriptures and I thought about it and I thought about the life that I'm living and the power that God has given me. And am I living a life, if Jesus were to write me a letter right now on how I'm doing, how would I score? I know how I should score because the power of God lives in me. And am I rejoicing in things, in security, in prosperity, in health, or am I rejoicing? Am I really rejoicing because my name is written in heaven? Because if I was, I would live differently than I am living right now. So I took my jar and I put back responses to that in it, and prayers and promises, whatever you want to put back in this jar. For God to put a burden on my heart for my neighbors, to not give me time, but to make me take time. Because I've got 24 hours in a day. I choose that to do what, how I want to do it. Oh, yes, sleep takes up some. But come on, be honest. Job takes up some. These things take up some. But you have time every day to do what you want to do. So are you rejoicing that your name is written in heaven and are you taking time every day to tell someone about the joy that's in your life, in your heart? So that's the purpose. There's plenty of jars up here. I'd much rather have your promises in here than beans. Okay? All right, just so you know that. 
Verse 12 of 1 John chapter 4. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, that's how we see God real and tangible. Because we can love people that are unlovable. That we can love our enemies. Because that's not something that we can do on our own, but something that we must do if God dwells in us. If we love one another, God remains in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God in Him. In this way, love has been perfected among us. We see it again, the perfection that we're going to. To be like our Heavenly Father. So that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. For in this world, we are just like Him. So I have to ask again, are you? And I had to say, I fall way short. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has, been, has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And we have this commandment from him. Whoever loves God must love his brother as well. I told you last week that because of fear, if Mark ended at verse 8, the women, or 9, I think it's 8, the women did not go and tell anyone. But we know that they did because they overcame their fear. I don't know what the fears are in your life, but Jesus was clear. He's clear in John chapter 4. He's clear elsewhere. Don't fear. Don't worry. Don't be concerned about the things of this world. You've got a new mind thought. The Holy Spirit lives in you and should be transforming your mind to transform your heart to transform you to action. Where your fears don't stop you from living like Jesus in this world. They overcame their fears. Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3 talk about being overcomers. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus if in fact Christ Jesus lives in you. And if the Spirit does live in you, then the love of God will live through you. Do you the great commandment? I'll let you put all the, I put the, the verbs in there. Do you live it? Do you do it? Do you think about it? Do you the great command? Do you the great commission? You should be doing both of those things however God calls you to do it. Are you His disciple? In John 13, verse 34, that's where we read about this new commandment straight from Jesus' own mouth. A new commandment I give you. Paul didn't give it. John didn't give it. Jesus gave it. That means God gave it. Love one another. How as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. He restated it and put a must in there. And then told you why in verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, which is what he called his true followers. And then it, all this comes to thought about if you are his disciple, you'll do this. If you are his disciple and you take your hand away from the plow, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Are you Jesus' disciple? Because if you are His disciple, then you will start to become more like Christ, which is what the word Christian means, little Christ or like Christ. That's why I said, if you're not a disciple, I'll argue with you that you're a Christian. And then second of all, Christian, plain and simple, are you like Christ in this world? That's huge. Where I, uh, excuse me, if you love one another. Verse 36, Lord, where are you going, Simon Peter asked Jesus. And I don't think it's any coincidence that these words come next. Because Simon Peter longed to go where Jesus went, but he couldn't go yet because he had a job to do. And Simon said, where are you going? 
And Jesus replied, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. You've got this mission to do first. And I'm going to prepare your eternal home. But look at Simon Peter's response. Verse 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Good question. Why is it then when we're saved, we just don't go on to heaven? Because we have a mission that has urgency in this earth. So will you continue to live for the goals, dreams, and desires that you once did, or will you live for the kingdom of heaven? Will it be what drives and motivates and compels you, the love that God gave to you that He offers to others, and you're the light of this world? Peter goes on to say, I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus said, Will you really lay down your life for me? Will you really lay down your life for Jesus? Now, Peter denied him after that. Peter had to have the power of the Holy Spirit come in before he was a changed man. But then Peter left everything behind, and he was even crucified for his faith. He didn't let the things of this world hold him back. He sold them all so that he could follow after Jesus and even take up that instrument of suffering and die literally. Of course, the next chapter is what you read last last week if you read it John chapter 14 don't worry because Jesus knows fear and doubts will come in what happened when Jesus was baptized he went immediately out into the desert driven by the Holy Spirit don't forget that to be tempted by Satan the first commandment was to come and follow after me and I will make you fishers of men those words were dute, dute opisu mu Dute is an adverb, it means come. Come so that you will do something, because it has to have an object. So that you will follow me, that's the object. Opiso is an adver adverb also, it means to get behind. So to follow Jesus, first of all, you have to come, you have to leave the world behind, and then you have to get behind Jesus so that you can follow him. You have to absorb his teaching as his disciple so that you will follow him all the way to eternity. In Matthew 4.19, you'll find that, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There's the dute of piso mu. But the next verse, And at once they left their nets and followed him. That's a different Greek word. It's akalutheu. And it means a different thing. It means to follow without reservation. Because once you leave that world behind and you come and follow after Jesus, you can't put your eyes on anything else. You have to fix them on the author and perfecter of our faith, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the treasure that's awaiting you in heaven. John 10, 27 uses that same word also. It says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Let me point out one thing here. It's your, your choice if you follow Jesus or you don't. No one else's. The devil didn't make you do it, nothing else. It's your choice on whether you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ or not. And if you're not a true disciple, then how's he going to make you into a fisher of men? Are you following Jesus or are you still following after the things of the world? It's God's love that compels you and drives you to live out the great command and the great commission. Or are you still hung on the things of this world? Just a few scriptures real quick. These are Jesus' words to His disciples. Luke 6.40 A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Luke 9, 23 and 24, Then Jesus said to all of them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke 14, 26 and 27, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
John 8, 31 and 32. So he said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 12, 25 and 26. Whoever loses his life, whoever loses his Whoever loses his life will lose it, excuse me, but whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be as well. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. John 15, 8, This is to my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving yourself to be my disciples. John 17, 20 and 21, I am not asking on behalf of them alone, but also on behalf of those who, live, who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Being a disciple so that you catch men and train them up to be disciples because you're driven and compelled by the love of God that He has offered and given you. You did, if you believed in Jesus Christ, receive the same power that made Peter a different fisher of men. That power lives inside of you. Is it living through you? As a child, I enjoyed fishing trips with my dad. I can recount several different ones. I can recount some hunting trips too that were kind of cool, but fishing trips. We went one time into Canada. We flew into International Falls, Minnesota, and then drove into Canada to these pristine lakes. And man, it was like virgin waters catching fish. We caught so many fish. You could only keep two. And we kept a stringer. We threw them in the bottom of the boat and just fished real quick and put water in the bottom and pulled up a stringer like this that I was holding tail to, you know, here all the way down to the boat. And then we turned them back out. Hopefully most of them lived. But I had to have a picture. Because they're walleye like this, and we were just catching them like that. Some people think they need to go to virgin waters. But Jesus tells us first to go right here. Go right here first. If you can't make a difference in your community, I don't know that He's calling you elsewhere, but I know He's calling you to your community to be a light to this world. I remember other fishing trips too. I can tell you about one that I went with. I guess it was his cousin, not my cousin. And boy, I got ridiculed because... I'm a guy that likes to take a bath and have clean underwear. I'm more like my dad now, though. Those things don't matter as much. I'm being taped too, aren't I? But that's okay. But boy, I got ridiculed because I didn't have enough clean underwear. And we had to go away from the fishing places up until I could wash underwear. And dad's like, take them and wash them in the lake. We've come here to catch fish. But see, it wasn't about catching fish. He did teach me how to, to fish and what bait and how to ca cast and what, what cover and terrain looked good. And, you know, we used a depth finder and other things. But you know what it was about? It was about spending time with my dad so that he could teach me to be a man. Are you spending time with Jesus so that you learn to fish for men? Because it's what compelled him to give up heaven and come and live a life where he didn't have the things that you and I have so that he could lay down his life to save you and I. Here's a few th thoughts I'm going to leave you with. Disciples, leave the world and its desires behind. Disciples, follow Jesus so that they can learn to fish. Disciples allow the Holy Spirit to transform them and empower them to fish. Disciples imitate Jesus and replicate Jesus' followers and imitators. Disciples draw others to follow Jesus through loving relationships. Disciples go wherever they're called to go and whatever the cost is. Jesus said this to you. Come Follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Is that what he's doing in your life? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that Jesus Christ would give up heaven, that we know that all of your promises are true, that Jesus came when it seemed like all in the world was dark and there was no light, that you had forgot about your promises and your people. But we know that you are faithful and you would never forsake, even when we're unfaithful, that you are a God that deserves all of our worship and all of our praise and that deserves all of our life 
all of our body, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind. And Father, we thank you for giving us the power to live out your great command and great commission. Oh God, empower us today. Give us a heart of Jesus to live for this world and not to live for ourselves, but to live for our Lord and Savior and King and for your kingdom until he returns. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.